Hi, thank you for joining us. This is episode 19 of The Mindset. And with me, we've got a special guest. If you would, tell us your name, uh, where you work, a little bit about what you do. Sure. Yeah, thanks for having me as well. Um, my name is Jen Sarr. I am the Assistant Director for Educational Justice at the Fargo Public Schools in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, in this role as Assistant Director, I have the opportunity to oversee the implementation of our trauma-informed practices and our uh, mental health-related initiatives, all aimed at fostering um, an equitable and supportive learning environment for each one of our students. Yep. Um, a specific a specific part of my work really does involve the um, the integration of UCARA system, um, mm. aiming at reducing our physical restraints and um, pro uh, promoting positive behavioral interventions. Gotcha. So, you know, we talk to a lot of schools, right? And there are a lot of school systems that, that welcome, you know, their care approach. But there's also a lot who either don't feel like it's right for them or that it's just another thing they would have to do or they're skeptical. What kind of led to Fargo's interest initially and what made you decide to pull the trigger on it? Yeah, that's a great question and, and a fun story to tell too. Uh, we started our implementation with Ukeru in, the, um, in 2019, in the winter of 2019, um, when really we were looking to reduce our restraints across the district um, and just prior to that, some of our Fargo Public Schools Board of Education members had attended a national school board conference where they mm -hmm. were first introduced to, to Ukeru. And so they really championed the efforts, brought the information back to the district. Um, and when I say they championed those efforts, they, um, they got behind it with the funding that was needed to make it happen as well. And so right. Um, at that time, then our district was very familiar with trauma-informed practices for large group approaches. But I would say as we began introducing Ukeru um, to our staff members, it really helped them see that individ individual level of trauma-informed care for the students that we're serving, which mm -hmm. really aligns perfectly with our strategic plan goal of creating um, both physically and psychologically safe learning environments for our students. Gotcha. So it's funny that you brought up to winter of 2019, because I was trying to think, how long ago was it that I first met you at that initial training? It's hard to believe it's been about five years. Right, right. Time flies. That's crazy. And to make it even funner, you know, you you all had to try to implement right as the pandemic was hitting. So how did that affect everything in the beginning, even trying to get this off the ground? Yeah, so we came out strong. So when we when we first implemented, right, it was prior to the pandemic. Nobody knew that, <laughs> that COVID-19 would even be such a thing. Right. Um, so we we really started with three of our elementary buildings that had our highest restraint numbers. So um, at that point, we uh, trained the assistant principals in each of those locations to be trainers. And then from there, we followed with, with training some select staff members, um, mostly those who were specifically um, responding to those critical incidents in the buildings where students mm -hmm. were experiencing trauma and maybe that escalated behavior. Um, and what we found in those three buildings is that our outcomes were were really almost immediate. And so um, hmm. so it was that was about a half year implementation and, and our, our restraint numbers really decreased dramatically. And so we we had that quantitative data that really led the charge in our conversation. Um, and that's an important piece to have, mm -hmm. but I think equally as important was the, was the qualitative data and the feedback that we were receiving from the folks in those buildings at the time. Um, again, all still, still pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, <laughs> um, but our staff members started saying things in those buildings like, well, I knew, I knew the principles of, of trauma-informed care um, mm -hmm. and how trauma can impact students, but I finally feel like I have the toolbox or the skill set or... Mm -hmm or the, the logical response for what, what I should and sometimes what I shouldn't be um, doing near or how I maybe should or shouldn't be responding to students in such a way. Um, and so it really, it, it beefed it up more from the theoretical approach to trauma-informed mm -hmm. care to the, the, the application of it. Um, 
So really the, the success in those three schools, that quantitative piece aligned with that qualitative piece mm -hmm. um, is what we knew we needed to, to, to jump in. And so when we, when we did get started in that, in that school year, that 20, um, you know, 2018, 19 school year, sorry, 2019, 20 uh, school mm -hmm. year where we had all of our elementary buildings at that point um, jumping on board. We just, we saw that, the, the, degree, the decrease that we were hoping for, um, again, in the quantitative piece, but that qualitative piece of our staff members also really expressing, um, you know, it was, it was now the how of responding. Yeah. So I remember I talked to you originally and, you know, you had some concern about the logistics, like how are we going to roll this out? And, you know, school systems are only given so much time to do training as it is throughout the year. Uh, did you run into much resistance in the beginning? And what was some of the skepticism? Yeah. Um, you know, to answer your question, did we run into much resistance? I would say no. But was there resistance? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, certainly. <laughs> and I think I think a lot of that came with the preconceived um, conclusions that people, you know, all tend to draw about mm -hmm. something that they don't know or don't understand. And so... Gotcha. Um, so I think we had some staff members um, who were hesitant and, you know, questioning this idea of a restraint-free mm -hmm. approach when prior to that, that, that was our, our response um, and, and fear probably about, you know, what were these big blue shields going to do? And, and like I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, drawing some of those incorrect conclusions about them and how they're used um, ultimately at their heart of that resistance always came back around about uh, safety, right? So it was never hesitancy in the, in the sense that they didn't want to keep staff members and students safe. That's always been um, um, at the, at the foundation of the work that they, that they've been doing, but um, you know, trying to understand what that would look like. So I think we right. just, we tried to really emphasize um, and educate, right? That ultimately mm -hmm. that's what we needed to do is we needed to educate um, on how, um, you know, that Ukiro is so much more than the blue shields. And, mm -hmm. and that, again, is that physical piece that we're able to lay our eyes on, but it is so much more that ever happens as a result of the approach um, yeah. before the shields are, are even, um, you know, picked up. And so just, again, reemphasizing that trauma-informed um, approach and the comprehensive training um, and then being intentional about sharing the data, the successes, and how to problem solve, because it doesn't always go swimmingly, right? It doesn't <laughs> go textbook style very often. Yeah. And it's about being intentional about creating some opportunities um, to debrief and to come back together. And, and just even each year as we bring our staff members back together, mm -hmm. um, you know, the foundation of that training hasn't changed. But what has changed for us over the years has been our our ability to even problem solve in an annual basis and and be, mm -hmm. making that UCARE training more specific just um, for the needs of, of the students and community members that we serve. Mm -hmm. How about with the students themselves? You know, during the the pad orientation piece, what was their response initially when it was first explained and introduced? Yeah, I think the kids were the easiest, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're certainly they're they're curious and they want to know more, but that's the mm -hmm. that's the the authentic curiosity of a child. And so it was mm -hmm. a great opportunity um, to introduce them, um, whether it was whole class style or individual or a combination thereof, depending on the situation. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that's still one of those pieces that that we continue to emphasize is just how important that that they become a natural part of our environment and not. Mm -hmm. Um, not something that is untouchable or unusable or set aside only for certain situations. Um, so we've had a, a being able to introduce them, and 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 I do think I was reflecting on this as we were as we were preparing for this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that that they are just a natural part of all of our environments, and I I know I mentioned a little bit earlier we started with elementary. I mean we are implemented now K twelve, and so we are all the way through our high schools, and mm. and there again wow. they're they're just natural pieces of of the environment, and um and you know we have to continue to educate and re-educate sometimes um, on those components, but again that's the that's the nature of the business we're in, so we're we're happy yep. to do so. That's awesome. Yeah, because I remember in the beginning, you just piloted in a certain amount of classrooms. Yeah. 
right? What was it three or four initially? Yeah, so the three buildings and then generally, right, we were targeting those classrooms that might experience more of those escalated behaviors. So some of our special education rooms or our positive behavior interventionists in those spaces. Wow. And and now as we've continued to expand and grow um, the implementation and the education around um, around this piece, I mean, and right, I will say uh, we were talking about the pandemic and there were certainly many um, horrible things that were a result of the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic. And um, I will say a silver lining for us in that was some of the um, the uh, federal dollars that came out to the school district that allowed us to ensure that we were able to fully supply and have shields available K-12, pre-K-12 um, mm-hmm. in our school district. And so that became an emphasis, even of those, some of those dollars at the time. So yeah, so now, I mean, they're they're strategically placed. I can remember you and I in the, the first uh, site visit or in that first training, we walked yep. around and even drew out maps and talked about where some um, appropriate places would be to, to place the shields based off of each school's environment mm-hmm. and classroom location, things like that. And um, we continue to do that. And so we have the opportunity to get into schools and when they're, when they're, um, their situations are are different from year to year, and so to be able to help them problem solve as well as well. Um, and I think one of my favorite questions anytime I go into you know for a, a site visit of, of any mm-hmm. kind when I see shields kind of stacked up and stuffed away, I'm <laughs> always asking about that. Like, why are these here and not not out and readily accessible right. if needed? And um, just always being able to continue that coaching and and that recognition that it is a it's a school wide initiative, not just a student specific mm-hmm. um, response. Yeah. Now the the case study that we have on our site that was from twenty two. Is that right? Twenty twenty two, I believe. Yes, I I do. I think it was right. It was kind of right after the yeah. pandemic. Yes. Yep. So. In that case study, you all were at a 67% reduction physical restraint use across the district, and some areas going restraint free. Have you seen, well, have you seen a bigger increase since then as you've rolled out, or has it stayed steady? Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, if you look at the quantitative data, you're going to see that it's it's ticked up a little bit. In in mm-hmm. my um, honest response to to you, I would say we're probably more steady than the fact that we've kicked up. And I think just it it's about that context again, because mm-hmm. as we as we were coming out coming out of the pandemic, right, and coming back to school, our initial baseline data, of course, had a um, you know, about two and a half months that there were no students. So when we had gotcha. that 67% uh, percent reduction, that took in mind that there were two and a half months of school there that everybody was was at home mm-hmm. um, and not in the, in, the, in the school building. And so, um, and then we had a, a year that was that kind of mix of, of hybrid and bringing yep. kids back to school, right? So there was- A lot of chaos. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, so I think the data on it is a little bit tricky, but um, mm-hmm. in full transparency, when we did the when we did the case study, it was a sixty seven percent reduction, recognizing mm-hmm. that it wasn't a full nine months of school. Sure. Um, so we we are currently right around that um, uh, from from pre COVID, right, like from our baseline data to last mm-hmm. year, we're at about a fifty four percent reduction in student restraint overall. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Still very, very pleased about Mm -hmm. the progress that has made in in that way. Um, Yeah, so do we have more work to do? Absolutely. And that is... All of us. (laughs) Yes, that is just the nature of public education. It's never done. No, just ever-changing systems and an ever-changing community, but very pleased that we have partners in all of our schools that are willing to come to the table to continue those conversations for, Mm -hmm. for everyone's safety. So if you could go back, knowing what you know now about implementation, what would you have changed? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you're like, I wish we would have done this a little different outside of the pandemic occurring, of course. All right. Right. (laughs) Um, Knowing what I know now, um, I I think I wish we would have communicated more to our parents and helped mm-hmm. them to better understand where we were headed. And, and I say that, and I think my big pause in that is also because, um, you know, the, the rollout and 
some of the bumps maybe that we hit also mm-hmm. were part of the education that we needed to get mm-hmm. to where we are now, right? And so right. I don't want to look back and say, oh boy, we, we really made a misstep on it because I don't see it as a misstep, but I do see it, it was as our opportunities to continue to learn and grow. Um, but but probably the, the parent communication um, is an area that is worth, you know, anybody else who might be earlier in their implementation, mm-hmm. um, really to pause and think about and, and how can they they share that information with families. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and again, we shared it with families, but I think we shared it with without knowing exactly how it would really impact us so positively. We certainly hoped and we could see the data from other school districts and other organizations <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, but there is something about, you know, kind of the, the proof is in the pudding perspective yep. of, of needing to see it um, do the same thing in your organization. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I say, um, where I pause to say, um, do I wish we would have done it differently? I do, but I don't know that we could have until we really had um, those experiences in our own environment and impacting our own um, students and our own staff members and our own mm-hmm. caregivers um, in such a way that that. I think it also happened exactly the way it needed to happen so that we could have those opportunities to learn and grow together. Yeah. And what was what were some of the parents and families' responses when they heard this was coming to Fargo? Yeah. Um, I think on the initial implementation, we had varied responses. Um, mm-hmm. Like staff, I think there were parents and, and community members because we've got lots of community members right. who are also um, in the walls of our schools that drew their own understanding of the protocols, the processes, and maybe the intention behind the shields. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have spent a significant amount of time trying to debunk debunk those myths um, that you hear isn't only about the shields and also then right. um, educating them on that trauma informed and those de escalation responses um, that precede any use of, of the shields or of the pads. Um, you know, I, I, I often think about a, a particular situation early on when we were in the implementation phase. Um, a parent in our school district. Um, very vocally expressed uh, dissatisfaction and resistance to the implementation and mm. and was somebody who showed up at our, our school board meetings regularly um, to to express that frustration or that concern as maybe what I should say but often came out as frustration and um, you know not so long ago that same parent was also um, in uh, before the legislature in, in our state really mm-hmm. encouraging and supporting other districts' use of Ukeru or anything mm-hmm. that might be similar to that. And so, so I do think, right, that is that process of also having those experiences. So again, where, where I say maybe parent education is an area I, I wish we had done more about, it, it is part of, of those lived experiences that, that help mm-hmm. um, understand and grow and advocacy for, for the implementation also grow. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, have you all had any parents go through the training? We haven't. You know, we've talked about it. And we've we've actually had some some meetings to try and think about what would that look like and and how can we support them. So we've not had anybody complete the training um, in in its entirety. Mm-hmm. We've probably done more um, problem solving with parents at at specific student meetings who. Mm-hmm where there might be some difficulties at home parents express and trying to help them also, um, you know, just develop some of those strategies in a one, in a one-on-one or um, right. uh, just in time uh, perspective, but we haven't done any full parent training at this point. Okay. I was just curious. Some places do, some places haven't. So it's cool that y'all are having those discussions though, to, to at least explore it there. For sure, for sure. And I, I do, I would say a lot of those conversations do come into our student, um, many of our student meetings were, were applicable. And um, I think that's too where we feel better about what that implementation, that understanding, not just from the school's perspective, but from the parents' perspective, mm-hmm. um, you know, that that they, they understand the why behind it, um, which it has grown from the initial implementation. Yeah, because I think we kind of take for granted, you know, we get so much training all the time, but a lot of families don't, right? They they get very limited information most of the time or 
or they're f from a school system that's in a community where, you know, they don't even know that a resource would even be out there for them to learn, you know, more strategies. So, And I think uh, when we can talk with our parents as well about, you know, the the opportunities that being trained in Okeru and in, even if the shields are something that have to be utilized, um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't take long for our parents to recognize or to say they would much rather that be our response mm -hmm. than a restraint, right? I mean, they don't. Oh, yeah. So it's, um, again, it's just that I think that comes down to that education and helping parents understand the why behind it um, and the, the protocols and processes, you know, that are included in the response. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, I mean, among a lot of things that's impressed me a lot about your your team that you have in the schools there is how seriously you all have taken debriefing you know because i feel like a lot of people it's it's an afterthought it's like oh it's one more meeting we got to try to figure out how to fit in so we just do like the bare bones processing but you know i've i've been there and conducted debriefing training multiple times i've been part of one of the debriefings that have happened in, in one of your schools like what, what was different from you all? Like what value did you find in that? And what value has it shown as you've been using it? I think the value that, that has been found by our staff members, um, came, you know, again, came authentically and, and mm -hmm. um, very, very naturally through the sense that, um, that sometimes we were responding to the same behavior or the same, mm -hmm. what it felt like a, a very similar situation over yeah. and over. We weren't seeing it, you know, really um, deep behavior decrease, right? And right. and so just recognizing that um, that 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 debriefing paired with the response is just is critical um, to be able to reflect on the incident or the the incidents to as a team who might respond and work with students to understand um, triggers, to understand the strategies that were that were used, um, or maybe those that were um, um, that might have been helpful at a time when every you know all the adults too are mm -hmm. in a thinking brain um, in order to better support the student and keep the students safe and keep the teachers and the staff members safe. Um, is as I met, as I said, it's just so is so critical. I think the the process itself fosters such a culture of continuous improvement, which is yeah. ultimately what every every organization ought to be striving for, and certainly mm -hmm. we in the Fargo Public Schools are as well. Um, and then that that debriefing really means that we can be responsive to the needs of everybody involved, so the adults and the youth. Um, all at the same time, which in turn really builds trust and collaboration among the among all team members and and the student too. Um, I think we have to re remember that that this, it's not just about the adults in those in those debriefing situations, but also mm -hmm. reflecting on um, the needs and the supports that would be beneficial to the student as well. So trying to think about it from every perspective. Um, it's that opportunity, right, to also exercise our creative brains, and mm -hmm. and we know that sometimes we, we do have yep. we have to think outside the box, and and um, all of us bring different skill sets to the table, and and some of our team members really have a um, have a gift for being creative and trying to trying to think outside the box. So to to bring everybody who's involved to the table at a real collaborative and trusting time um, is important. I will say mm -hmm. uh, we we still struggle with it in terms of finding the time, right? Like I think mm -hmm. I think for again for anybody who might be in the early implementation or considering implementation, um, our schools who have the most success with debriefing plan for it as part of the daily schedule or as part of the even the weekly schedule. It can't go yeah. much much longer than than the weekly schedule though. <laughs> Um, but right, it's it's too easy and too um, it's too easy to plan our staff members' schedules with without it, and then mm -hmm. it's almost impossible when you do to try and find the time because right, our there's always there's always so much to do, and so being intentional about what that schedule looks like. Um, we've got one of our schools that 
rather than ending their day with debriefing, they start their day with debriefing. And they do that mm-hmm. really intentionally um, to give everybody a little bit of space mm-hmm. um, from the particular incident and um, to come back at, at it maybe with, with a, a rested and refreshed sense. Um, but still not too too far away from the incident itself. But we also have other other buildings that it works best for them to take the last 15 minutes of their staff's contracted time to to sit down and um, reflect on anything that has happened that day and make sure that those responses and um, and planning for for the next school day or um, the school days ahead, the incidents that might might be on the horizon. So I just I think it's critical that it's it's intentionally built into the schedule rather than mm-hmm. hoping to find the time after an incident because then it's just too easy to to never find that debriefing time right it's it's almost like the saying if you're if you're waiting till you have time you'll never find time <laughs> right so it may be i don't know maybe you'll say it's the same thing for this but you know having used whatever crisis intervention program you've had in place before us. When Ukiru, when our approach came in, how did you find the time as a school system to work in this additional training now? Yeah, you know, I'll be I'll be honest that that we had so much support from our board of education was a mm-hmm. was helpful to us. And so um, as I mentioned, they they budgeted for it, and so we had some dollars that were built built right into the system from the beginning. So we integrated the training um, mm-hmm. into our existing professional development schedule, as well as providing opportunities before the school year started. And we've continued to grow that idea mm-hmm. of the more uh, 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 the more staff members that we can get trained prior and, and recertified prior to the school year getting underway, the yep. less we have to pull them from the great work that they're doing with students. Um, right. You know, every day. But that's not always possible. So mm-hmm. uh, just kind of on a timeline, we we train and recertify all of our trainers. Um, and we're very proud that we have almost, uh, a, we have one trainer in almost every one of our 23 campuses mm-hmm. currently. Um, very proud of that, that fact and that we have somebody um, intentionally built in for some of that coaching and debriefing um, that needs to happen given whatever the situations might be. So mm-hmm. we we train and recertify those folks early in August. And then that following week, we do five, five full days of training across the district. And we pay, that's outside of the contracted time. So we pay all of our staff members um, who wish to take advantage of that time to come in and get that UCARE training accomplished annually. And that's where then all of our trainers also um, are on a rotating schedule to make sure that we can um, um, handle the numbers and the the sites right. that we're we're doing those those training sessions at. So, um, so that's before the school year gets underway. And then once we are underway with the school year, we're in our second year of offering monthly training. And and we didn't start out that way. Um, instead, we started out hoping that those building trainers could just be responsible for training the folks at their building who didn't attend in August. Um, and it worked to some degree, but again, just like the debriefing comment, when it's not built into the schedule, then you're, you know, you're trying to find the time and it's not always convenient. And so just in, in conversation with the trainers, they were the ones that really said, if we could just offer it during the contracted day, once a month and know every month, you know, how that was going to happen. So the second Tuesday of every month for the last two years has been our UCARO training. Um, and so we offer a new user session that day. And then early in the year, we offer two recertification sessions. Um, now, as we're getting more into the, the mid-year, we scale it back to just one recertification session because most of our folks now have been recertified. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I think just being intentional about building it in. Oh, one of the other things that I wanted to mention for this year is Um, that we had had a recent rewrite of our strategic plan. And so our Mm -hmm. strategic plan now has um, the expectation that that every one of our buildings will have a 30 to one student staff ratio of trained Mm -hmm. staff members at the modified D level or higher. So for every 30 students in uh, one of our school buildings, there's Mm -hmm. at least one person that's been trained to the modified D level. In addition wow. to their response teams, which have, um, of course it, um, have fully certified uh, UKERU staff members, um, 
And that we've gotten a little bit of pushback on that early this summer as we rolled it out, especially in our larger mm. schools, right? Because that's when yeah. you start talking about, uh, you know, a thousand plus students in a, in a, in a school building. That's a lot of staff members who mm -hmm. need some training. Um, but we had one of our high schools who just embraced it and, and they happen to have two trainers at their building. And so over a, a series of weeks, they pulled their, um, all of their uh, classified staff, all of their hourly staff for additional mm -hmm. training. Um, and it was, it was powerful. And then that building itself also had such a great opportunity to raise building specific questions and problem solve as a, as a school building team. Which our, That's great. you know, when, when we open up our training across the district, we have uh, staff members from all different schools together. So we can still problem solve, but this was a, a fantastic opportunity then for that school, just as a school unit, to also have some of that time to um, build some trust and, and clear up any misconceptions, as well as mm -hmm. developing some, some real team efforts in how they respond. So. Um, so that's really what our training has looked like. But again, it's been one of those things that we've had to continue to reflect on and modify yep. and uh, take feedback on. And um, no doubt we'll continue to do so. But that's where we're at at this point. So I've got two more questions for you here. So first one is, you know, you've, we've talked a lot about, you know, reduction, restraint and things like that. Um, how about morale or just general mindset work culture? What types of impact have you seen, if any, you know, since the beginning? Yeah, and I, yeah, I think I'd loop back to what I had said, just that that idea that our staff members um, are talking about that they feel like they have the tools in in the situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we are in a in a situation in public education all across the country, right? That we're talking about mm -hmm. how do we how do we attract and retain staff members? Yep. And um, absolutely. And so I, I, I think when we can pour into our staff members who might be the closest to some of these um, to tricky situations in our school buildings, and then provide those opportunities for debriefing as well as coaching, um, you know, we, we recognize that, that we, we value them and we want to make sure that they have the skills that they need to, mm -hmm. to do what they, they're being called to do and what we're so grateful mm -hmm. um, that they're that they're willing to do on behalf of our students and, and our community at large. So um, the, the idea that um, that we're equipping them with the skill set that they need um, is really what we're hearing from from some of our new staff members. I, I had a situation in one of our um, September training sessions. It was a new user session. So somebody mm -hmm. who was hired right up close to the start of the school year or just shortly thereafter. And after that full day of training, right, it's, it's always fun for me to watch kind of just that personality of that group on the full day of training. Mm -hmm. Everybody's real quiet, reserved as you get started. And then by the end of the skills on in that day, right, like they have bonded in such a way that um, <laughs> only a new care participant can truly understand. But um, but she said, this has been the best training I have ever had. And, and that she actually came to us out of a residential treatment center. Mm -hmm. um, so just to also recognize that she, she came to us wanting to be further upstream um, in the work that she was doing and still feeling like she, it was there then that she got some of the best training um, through the UCARA training that she's, she's ever had, I think is a testament to the, to the work. Um, and to the training and the um, and to your trainers and to the trainers absolutely yeah. they're, they're incredible and they are, um, they are they are living the experiences every day which I think is is truly helpful to all of our staff members who get trained and recertified because they they're they're in the work right they're not somebody who, mm -hmm. who floats in and um, and is you know some expert from no no offense Christopher but really some expert from someplace else these are folks mm -hmm. that are that are in the Fargo Public Schools doing the work and being able to draw those um, uh, case studies or examples and and really speaking mm -hmm. to uh, our folks authentically. Awesome. So my last question for you, Jen, you know, with all the progress you've made, you know, still looking to continue that forward, how do you sustain the culture and safety and everything that's changed 
so far? Like, what are some things you all do to try to sustain that? Mm -hmm. I think, right, we're, we're always looking at the data. So mm -hmm. just like we, we talked about, always an opportunity for us to come around the data qualitatively, quantitatively, um, and, and being able to report that back out. So um, being able to share with our, our individual building leaders, and that's one of the pieces is with, uh, with our strategic plan rewrite, Mm -hmm. is being able to share with them specifically about the progress that they, the building have made in their, in their um, implementation growth. And then how is that um, showing up in their right. restraining groups, right? And so intentionally making that connection um, for them. Um, and then mm -hmm. it's also about our, our, um, our district leaders and our, our school board, right? They were, mm -hmm. they were at the heart of, of helping us in the early stages of the implementation and, and um, being able to share, we share the data with them on an, in an annual report, um, report out to the board each fall that also helps them to see the what that looks like. Um, but it also means coming around and having just those transparent conversations as well about where we're experiencing some snafus and, and where we need to get our heads mm -hmm. to the table, um, how, we can, how we can help support. And it also means for us because our our restraint protocol hasn't gone away either. So talking mm -hmm. about what does the continuum look like, um, and how do we how do we make sure the right folks have the right training, but that we also we also know when you know when that when is it appropriate for our restraints. So right. um, any at at this point, this is our first year in the school district that we're also um, we've got somebody that's reviewing every single restraint. So rather than just mm. having our buildings re record them and report mm -hmm. them as they have for many years, um, we've got somebody taking a look at each one of them, them that comes in to also offer some coaching and some guidance about um, you know what else maybe could have been an option or to have a conversation mm -hmm. about it at, at any rate to see to see where that goes. Um, so I think it is just, it's, it's about continuing the conversation as it relates to the data, as it relates to the training um, and, and being intentional about those individual cases that may be some stumpers to, to just come around it and have, have those conversations. Um, we've always appreciated the support that we've received from you and from all of your team members always being accessible to us, um, whether it's through the, the idea of implementation at the district level or whether it's a particular case that we just need mm -hmm. some outside eyes or um, you know, folks who are also in, in similar work but not in a public education system that could um, right. shed some, some new and creative thoughts uh, on our end too. So, it's a certainly a team effort from our staff members all the way up through our district leadership and then our, our partnership with with you and all of your team members too. Oh great. Well Jen, I'd I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk to us here this afternoon. Hopefully any any nervousness you had about the interview is gone now. You you made it, we're at the end. So we made it all the way to the end. Well, I appreciate it, Christopher. Thanks for having me so much. Absolutely. And thank you all for tuning in. Again, this was episode 19. We'll see you next time.